Well, good morning. Here we are. We're on. How about that? Welcome to Sunday School. And it's um, our adult lesson, and today we are looking at the holy place. Now, um, we spoke last week of the tabernacle, the, the, as it were, the tent, the outer skirts of the tabernacle. And this was a uh, portable church for the children of Israel as they moved throughout the wilderness. And, of course, it became a permanent site with uh, David whenever he put it together and put the ideas and together and Solomon built it, that it came, became a permanent place at that period of time. And it was also a permanent place in the, in the time of Jesus la- located in Jerusalem. So uh, in this, um, what they would consider the tabernacle, there was the outer court, which was a, um, in the time of Moses, it was a curtain barrier uh, that surrounded the perimeter of the um, holy place. So in the holy place was this building in the middle, or in the, in the not in the middle, but in the, the back of this court, there was this structure that was there, and it was divided into two um, sections. The first was the holy place, and the second section was the most holy place, the holies of holies. And the holies of holies, that second place, um, was the place that the priests went into once a year with the, the blood of the lamb and sprinkled it around the altar for the sins of the people. But today, we are looking at the holy place, the, the, um, the, the entrance to this tabernacle, this place, this structure. And it, in this structure, we have specific um, vessels that God had told Moses that how they were to be built and what they were to be uh, what they were to be there for so in the holy place uh, we can learn much about Christ um, because these of course these um, these vessels that were there are re- very much reflective of Jesus and who he is and uh, what he has come and what he is to us and what he was uh, designated or uh, fulfilled in the New Testament what has prophesied in the Old. So um, as we look at the tabernacle, many of the instruments are, uh, of the Old Testament were worshipped. Worship symbolized both the life of Christ and his work towards uh, to salvation. So the lampstand is the first thing that we're looking at, but it, we're, not, we're not reading the scripture to it. It's just kind of outlining what's, what's in there. The lampstand was a picture of Christ who is the light of the world. And uh, so we have the lampstand that we'll be looking at. And then there is um, the showbread, which is the bread uh, that was prepared by the priest. And it was placed on a uh, a stand. uh, And the um, bread was prepared by the priests. And there were 12 loaves symbolizing or representing the, the 12 tribes of Israel. And then uh, there is the, um, what is the next one? I don't have it here, but in our, in our um, lesson, we find where there is a, another structure, another uh, piece of furniture that is there with a uh, bowl on it, which burns with incense before the, before the curtain, before the presence of God. And we'll find out what that is. It is the... Uh, it's made of shit and wood, and it is covered with gold. So only the best <laughs> for in this, um, in this tabernacle. So the first is the lampstand. And this is in Exodus 25, verse 31 to 40. So, and thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold. Of beaten work shall the candlestick be made. His shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knobs, and his flowers shall be of the same. So meaning, if, you ha- if there, there are pictures, I don't know if we have it pulled up, but anyhow, it's a, it's a candelabra. It's seven, there, there are seven candles. There's one main stand, and then there's three candles that come out, um, stems that come out from each side. And those um, stems coming out on top of them were bowls, or, and it says flowers, and uh, in the flowers was oil, and the oil burned 24 hours a day because there, was no, there were no windows <laughs> in the tabernacle. 
So there's no way to see what's going on unless the lamp is lit. And so symbolizing Jesus Christ, the light of the world. And lamp also that lights our way to the presence of God. There's, there's many, um, many references there. So since the lamps and lampstand were never to go out, the priest serviced them morning and evening. So they were delegated to go in and um, make sure there was oil in the lamp um, in each of the seven uh, containers so that the oil did not uh, run out. And the, the we, we see that, that they reminded the Israelites that their spiritual light came from the Lord and they were to be a light to the nations. So we know that Israel, I don't think, ever really caught the vision of being the light to the world they saw themselves as the exclusive owners of God. And um, that was not their, I don't, from my understanding, it was not God's perspective or God's reason for calling Abraham. Well, there are many reasons. One of the reasons was that, he that would, through one group of people, he would demonstrate and show his uh, faithfulness and show uh, himself to the world. Um, but in the whole process, the, Jew the Jewish community at that, you know, in the Old Testament, saw themselves as the uh, representatives of God, but only to themselves. And you know, everybody else, Gentiles, were, uh, you know, at the time of Christ, they were, they were. Um, if you if you rub shoulders with a Gentile, you had to go through ceremonial washings, and you couldn't go to a Gentile's home. You know, so that was just totally forbidden. So. Um, when you're thinking then of the um, of Jesus in the light of the world, we find that his light is um, to light and to shine in darkness. Uh, the lamps illuminated the tabernacle in order for the priest to carry out their functions. So, so you can see if if you were in this tent, um, in the first section of this tent, which was um, covered by the, the the trappings of this tent. Um, I, I, uh, I can't even begin to tell you how many layers of fur and um, fabric and so on that were laid over them. Uh, but inside, there was, it was dark, but the lampstand, this, uh, this candelabra, was always lit. Then in the next section of, of Leviticus, we jump to Leviticus 24, and this is the oil for the lampstand. And the Lord made, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring unto thee pure oil, olive beaten for light, to cause the lamps to burn continually, without the veil of the testimony in the tabernacle of the congregation. Shall Aaron order it from the evening unto the morning before the Lord continually? It shall be a statute forever in your generations. He shall order the lamps upon the pure candlesticks before the Lord continually. So inside of this first room, there is this, as we said, this um, lampstand. But in order for the lampstand to function, it had to be supplied with oil. And so the command was for the purest of the olive oil would be used for the uh, for the congregate for the for the lampstand um, Exodus 33 11 says the Lord um, who spake unto Moses just as a man speaks with his friend so when we're thinking of Moses receiving the commands for this for this um, tabernacle and for all the instruments they're in and the building and so on uh, you know it's saying that the conversation between God and Moses was as a man speaking with a man so Moses met with God, <laughs> and God spoke to him uh, in a way that he understood and that, you know, it was, um, it was a conversation between he and God, and God gave to Moses all of the instructions for what he was to do. And so the question in, uh, uh, that follows that statement is, in what way do you or do we hear the voice of God, you know? How do we hear or know God's promptings? You know, um, if we say, uh, I don't, <laughs> you know, if you tell people God speaks to you, well then, does that light speak to you? <laughs> because they want to know, you know, do, do other things speak to you? And 
generally, um, well, the, un the understanding is that with God, there are, there are impressions in our heart and our mind. It isn't like an audible voice. There are impressions or the scripture. The scripture, can, we can be reading the scripture and it speaks to us in a way that, wow, this is very important. This is something I should look out for. This is something I should believe for. Or, you know, so that's why uh, the, if you don't learn it, how can you do it? <laughs> uh, expression came from somewhere. Um, but uh, if you don't learn it, how can you do it? So the challenge for us is to learn what the scripture says and to be informed about what the, 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 the spirit and the word, what they say. And then how that we, how that we learn this and how, how do we uh, allow it to become part of our life. So God does speak to us in many ways, sometimes through circumstances and sometimes through, you know, people uh, or, you know, different things. So, um, but always that when someone tells you they have a word from the Lord, <laughs> um, you must have that word first. <laughs> You, the people can, I can, you know, like if I were saying something, God told me to tell you uh, something, well, and you had no clue about it, well, then that would be subject to uh, scrutiny and doesn't mean you should do it because it should only be a confirmation, not, uh, not direction. So the, the Holy Spirit should already have been speaking to you about it, and therefore I or someone else would come and say, well, God has been talking to me about and we find that in that whole process that we would be able to underst perhaps uh, understand the, the will of God. So it's, it's not what, um, it, just because someone says that it's God who spoke doesn't mean that it is. Uh, but we must have the confirmation. So the, the children of Israel were responsible for providing the oil used to light the lampstands. So... Um, it's kind of like in our own life that we are responsible. <laughs> we have we have the Christ in our heart and our life, but we are responsible for providing the oil. That we're responsible for doing our part in our devotions and our reading the scriptures, attending church. I'm looking at the camera at that moment. <laughs> attending church. <laughs> you always zoom in on that one, you know, emphatically. You know, put my arm in the raise and put a fist there. You need to be in church. Well, in, in, in the sense that if you can be, you should be in church. And reason, the reason for that, the Bible says, do not, do, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. And also, whenever you're left on your own, to, you're, you're left with your own ideas and you're you know, seeing something through uh, the medium that we have, uh, with television or broadcast or whatever, you don't really see the person, you don't know the emphasis. You know, how many things have people misunderstood, even though they've been standing there listening to a person and still misunderstood what that person's intent was? Well, how much more so does that happen uh, whenever we are separated from individuals and we're left to our own thoughts and feelings? Oh, this is what he means, you know. <laughs> it goes along with what I believe, you know. And it may be completely opposite of what, the intent of the scripture is. So it's important that we rub shoulders with people and that our faith is encouraged and we're not isolated in our, in our faith. Uh, the children of Israel then were responsible for the oil and they were, they were to bring only the best of the oil. Um, so in the same way, we're responsible to bring our best before God. Um, you know, he doesn't turn away. Uh, and, and in this case, it's like the sacrifice of the lambs. They were not allowed to bring a lamb that was defective, that was bruised, that, was, that was, um, had some kind of wound or something, wasn't going to survive, so let's give that to God. No, they were to bring the perfect lamb, the lamb that was totally healthy and, and, and without blemish and spot, and that was the lamb they were to offer as a sacrifice. So in our life, we are to give our best to God and to do what we, what we do is to do it to the best of our ability and, um, you know, seeking to do the best that God has, that God has called us to. So, so while bringing in the oil was the congregation responsible, the proper use of the oil was left to the priests. And um, 
So the same way that uh, in, a, in a congregation, you know, we give our tithes and offerings, but it's the responsibility of the officials of the church to uh, use the offering, use the monies given responsibly and for what they are designated. So the lampstand lit the holy place and it lit the holy place which took them to the presence of God. And we think about Jesus. He, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know, no man comes unto the Father but by me. So Jesus is the way to the presence of God. Um, so that's one of the uh, important uh, figures that we see in the lampstand. Okay, next is John chapter 1, verse 4 through 9 and 8, 12. Basically, it just reads John 1, 4 and John 8, 12. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, verse 5, and the light shineth in darkness, and darkness comprehended it not. Then we move to chapter 8, verse 12. Then spake Jesus again to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So John, in the gospel here, affirms Christ was present with the Father at the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So um, John affirms that Jesus is the Word. Jesus is, he was, he was with the Father, and he came from the Father, and he is one with the Father, okay? So um, God created all things through him, and verse 4 says that basically without him nothing was created. So Jesus is the creator, and the life that is given to uh, this planet, to, the, to, the, to us, and to people, is the light of life, which uh, is uh, the life of, that comes from Christ. He is the one who sustains it. So all life, physical, spiritual, and even eternal life, emanates from Jesus. And furthermore, his life gives light to humankind. So whenever we are seeing that the church, believers, we become the light of the world. We become the light to those who live in darkness. So what we believe and how we live out our faith is the light that shines in the darkness of this world. So the word light appears 21 times in this gospel. At least 21 times light appears in the gospel of John. Jesus identifies himself as the light of the world twice. His light chases away darkness and never overcome. And his light is never overcome by darkness. So um, David wrote in the Psalms, The Lord is my light and my salvation. 27.1 for, for with thee is the fountain of life, and thy light shall be, shall we see, in thy light shall we see light. So this is not, um, you know, stretching <laughs> the, what is it? The, the, whenever uh, Jesus is uh, a foreshadow, he is a, um, what is it? I don't know, I forgot, went through my head. Anyhow, the tip type, he's a type of Christ. The light is the type of Christ. There's the word I was looking for, type. So he, he is the type. And so we're not just inserting this to say, oh yeah, Jesus is the, is the light of the world. No, Jesus said that about himself, referring to, uh, uh, as it were, setting up the tabernacle and setting it up in the present. Jesus is the light that shines in, this, uh, in the world of darkness. Uh, perhaps the strongest statement of all was when Jesus declared himself to be the light of the world. Um, so, um, what else? So we have this declaration of Christ and who he is. Do you have the lampstand? So there's the, the candelabra. And um, I don't know what that gold thing is behind him, but uh, <laughs> uh, and I think what, what should be there is the curtain that... Um, Oh, no, not there, because that's the wall. That's the wall that um, is alongside, somewhere along the edges of the wall, because in a, in, a, in a few moments we get to the altar of incense, which is before the curtain. So this is the light that lights up the entire um, area, and um, gold was a good, good choice, <laughs> because it's very reflective. 
So that's the, the candelabra. I have a candelabra, a little one from home. Yeah, from Israel. It's made of gold. <laughs> Don't think so. I'd have sold it if it was made of gold, but no, not one. So the menorah has nine, and it, one of the candles is lit every night during the, the process, the, the day passing of the days. But here we have the candle, uh, the lampstand, and it has seven. And the nation of Israel is... Uh, they, you know, one of the symbols is the, the menorah, excuse me, the lampstand, and also the, the, um, the trade, the commerce, the visitor's bureau. The, um, the symbol for the visitor's bureau is uh, Caleb and Joshua with a long stem and the grapes hanging on them, and they're bringing it back to the children of Israel. Well, let's go to this place over here, Israel. Let's take the promised land. So they, that's the, the picture, and they use that as their symbol of, of, of their commerce to visit Israel. All right, uh, enough of that. So the holy bread, this is in, Je going back to Leviticus, Leviticus 24. And thou shalt take fine flour and bake 12 cakes thereof. Two tenth deals shall be in one cake. I have no idea what two tenth deals is. Uh, every Sabbath he shall set it in order before the Lord continually, being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. And it shall be for Aaron, Aaron's and his sons, and they shall eat it in the holy place, for it is the most holy unto him of the offerings of the Lord made by fire by a perpetual statute. Not everything the priest did was exciting. <laughs> Baking bread. Um, so they, they, the arranging and caring for the bread of, of, the, of his presence. Now, whenever we take communion, the, sometimes that communion bread is called the bread of his presence. And this is, and that's where this title or that uh, comes from is this particular scripture that it is the bread of his presence. The priest's responsibility was to bake 12 loaves of bread uh, representing the, tri the tribes using the purest flour. They were to arrange the loaves in two rows of six each and put them on the gold table. Pure frankincense was placed in the table beside the loaves of bread. Thus, incense was burned as an offering to the Lord while the bread belonged to the priest. The ritual was followed every time the bread was changed. So you have the bread of table of showbread. So six loaves, and uh, that, this table was made out of shittim wood, and it was covered with gold, and it had uh, where the, it could be carried, uh, the they weren't allowed to just pick it up. It had to be carried on these uh, poles that went through the... Uh, so this is the bread of his presence. So to the... I, I doubt... Well, I, hopefully they understood that the presence of God was in the um, holy place, in the holy of holies, but it was a, a way for them to understand that God was with them. So wherever they traveled... God was there with them. That's why the tabernacle was being able to took, be able to tear it down and carry it to the next place and rebuild it. And um, when the rebuilding, again, what went on was the lampstand, the table of showbread, and then we have the altar of incense, which is coming up. And so it represented the presence of God being with them. And in the New Testament, what do we have? We have that um, God, Jesus says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. His presence is always with us. And the 12 loaves represented the 12 tribes that the presence of God was with them and that they, um, uh, God was with each of the 12 tribes. Um, John 6, Verily, verily, I say unto, he, unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. And this is where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. So we have him, I am the light of the world, I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. 
So the manna was not the same as the bread of life, which Jesus is, nor was it the same as this bread here. This is the bread which uh, cometh down from heaven, that it may eat thereof and not die. Jesus, the bread of life coming from heaven. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. So Jesus uh, makes it clear that anyone who believes in him receives eternal life. Um, whoso, John 3.16, whosoever liveth, whosoever believes and trusts in me shall never die. So we move on. Christ is the true um, legacy of life, um, bread of life, and as such he means that and only in him will we experience life to its fullest. And we'll move on. Um, Exodus chapter 30. This is the golden altar of incense. <laughs> and thou shalt make an altar to burn incense upon. Of shittim wood shalt thou make it. And thou shalt put it upon, oh, me, thou shalt put it before the veil that is by the ark of the testimony before the mercy seat that is over the testimony where I will meet with thee. So we have in this holy place, the lampstand, the candelabra. We have the table of showbread, which is the, 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 the bread representing each of the 12 tribes. And here in the back, as it were, the back of the room, in front of the veil that it leads into the holies of holies, is this table of incense. And so it is here in this incense, and, and let's go on. And shall burn uh, thereon sweet incense every morning, and he dresses the lamps, and he shall burn incense upon it. So whenever they put the oil in the lamp morning and evening, which is to keep the light burning in, inside this tabernacle, they are also to burn incense in this, um, in this bowl, a bowl of incense on this particular uh, piece of furniture. Do you have that one? As we kind of, what we're looking at here then, the, the incense is, it represents the prayers of the people. So, when every, and you wonder what happens to your prayers. <laughs> well, even in the, uh, in the book of Revelation, it talks about how that the prayers of the people are as like incense before the Lord. You know, we use, people use incense. It's like, you know, in some of the churches, you, you, you go to um, Catholic, Roman Catholic or um, the Orthodox, you know, they use a lot of incense. And I always, what on earth, is, you know, what does it mean, you know? And, and but the, I, the, the thought behind it is, the incense represents prayers ascending to heaven. So whenever we are praying it is as, and praising God, it is a, as a sweet-smelling incense before God. So God doesn't mind your praying. I don't want to bother him, you know. People say, I don't want to bother him. He's busy. Well, <laughs> I think he can take care of <laughs> us and all the problems he, he, you know it's all going it's all going according to plan and your prayers are like incense rising to heaven so it, it's not like uh, a problem you know was, uh, you know making a big stink <laughs> over something but whenever we pray earnestly we are we are our, our prayers are like incense before God and so this was to represent and what is Jesus Jesus, he is a seated high priest, and what does he do? He ever lives to make intercession for us. So Jesus intercedes for us. He is it where he takes our prayer. I hope that it's that he inspires us to pray according to his word. You know, someone's sick, you know, problems, bring it before the Lord, rejoicing, bring it to God. So God is, um, we have learned that the scripture in, informs us to bring all of our requests before the Lord, make your request known unto him. So we are to make our requests known to him, and they're not, it's not a problem. It's not a, uh, you know, something that he gets, he gets overwhelmed with it. You know, no. <laughs> that they are, and, and, you know, and, and of course they're not, God doesn't turn them into incense, but he says they are as, in, in, as incense before the Lord. So our prayers are not um, put aside they are very important, and they offer, um, as it were, incense to the Lord. Now, I don't think you should go home and burn incense. 
Most people who burn incense aren't thinking of prayers. <laughs> but the true meaning uh, of it in the scripture is that they were burning incense and it represented prayers to the Lord. Now, if you burn incense and you are, you know, and you're thinking of these are my prayers to God, okay, maybe, maybe you can, you know, and you like whatever. I, I just could never stand, the, you know, it always bothered me. But um, anyhow, so Aaron lighteth the lampstand and he burned the incense upon it. So he would, he would fill each of the vessels on the, the candelabra, he would fill them with oil and, you know, so they would burn for 12 hours because they did it morning and evening and they would put the incense uh, on this, in this bowl and burn it before God. So it was, the, you know, the, the Ark of the Covenant, which is the Ark where the Ten Commandments are, the, the, oh, the Aaron's rod that buds and a, a pot of, of um, manna, and on top of that, the lid, which is cherubs and the mercy seat is underneath their wings. So right in front of that is the, is the incense, the prayers of the people going up before God. So... Everything that's in the Old Testament tabernacle points to us and gives to us a picture of who Jesus is and what he has come to fulfill. So when Jesus arrives, he doesn't just arrive. This is the thing that bothers me. Sometimes Jesus is no different than Muhammad or, you know, somebody Confucius. And no, he's totally different because there's a whole nation of Israel's history and the tabernacle and everything that they did and the prophets and ever all pointing towards this one person their Messiah coming and what he would do how he would live even how he would die and how he would be born of a virgin you know in a certain place all of this was full pre all of this was presented before it ever happened and when Jesus came he fulfilled all of these things so he just didn't show up. It was, pre he, you know, God purposely brought all of this together. And uh, we see all of these things in Christ. I want to finish here. And ye shall offer no strange um, incense thereon, no burnt sacrifices, no meat offering, neither shall thou pour drink offerings thereon. So this altar of incense was specific for incense. It wasn't for any other things. No strange incense. <laughs> Um, no burnt sacrifices, no meat, uh, drink offerings, nothing was to be put there but the prayers of the people. So that's how important the prayers of the people that God put them in, you know, uh, w was important that he placed them right before his presence uh, in the holies of holies and nothing was to go there except the prayers of the people. How important they are. So always remember your prayers are very important. And Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of the of it once a year, and the blood of sin offering at atonement at atonement, once in the year shall he make atonement upon upon it throughout your generations. It is the most holy unto the Lord. So Aaron was to um, make the atoning sacrifice uh, upon the altar, and um, that was to be taken into the holies of holies once a year, but. And wasn't this, it wasn't performed upon this altar, all right? So then finally we have in Revelation chapter 5, and when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps, golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. <laughs> so there again, the incense is, brought the full of vials full of odors which which represents the prayers of the saints so every prayer is heard and we could say that every prayer has been held and has been recorded and is held before God and continues to be so I think that's good for where we're at um, so whenever next week I think we do the holies of holies yeah we do the inner, the inner part of this uh, tabernacle, um, of this inside structure. Do you have the, the tabernacle again, the whole thing? So if you look, 
You see the white curtains, that's the, uh, and, and just inside the white curtains, that's the outer court. And the first um, altar, you, as soon as you enter into that, you enter to the sacrifice. Jesus is the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. He is the sacrifice. So you can't get to God except through Christ. <laughs> so it is his death upon the cross. Um, so then the next is a, 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 a basin that the priests were to wash themselves before they went into the holy place. So inside that little building then is the holy place, which we just discussed is the lampstand, which is a seven candelabra morning and evening they fill it with oil. There's no windows in there, so it's only the light of the lamp stand. Jesus is the light of the world, takes away the darkness. So and on, the, as it were, the right-hand side, that's a table of showbread, and there are um, 12 loaves representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And right back in the back of that area, there's a curtain, and there is the altar of incense. That's where the incense is up God's prayers. The prayers of the people are going up to God. Now, behind that veil is what we're talking about next week. <laughs> and that's the Ark of the Covenant uh, and what is represented by this was God's presence among the people. So wherever they went, the presence of God was with them because they, picked, they took apart this tabernacle and moved it with them. So it's, um, it's quite interesting if you, you, know, you do a full-blown study on all of this and the priest, the, the priest garb that he would wear and, and everything. Everything had a significant uh, had a significance to it. So, in all of this, we see a picture of Christ. Father, we thank you for being with us, for your presence, that, Lord, your light that shines in our hearts and lives drives away darkness. Lord, our prayers are important. They are as incense before you. And so, Lord, we, we offer our prayers to you, our praise to you, thanking you for all the wonderful things you've done for us and that you continue to do. We ask your blessing. God, we give you our praise. In Jesus' name, amen.